Hello everyone, my name is Kevin Finnegan and this is a presentation on semiconductor nanocrystals and how to control their shape during synthesis. So this presentation is based on a paper put out by Peng et al. entitled Shape Control of Cadmium Selenide Nanocrystals. So I'm going to be looking at, at cadmium selenide and other semiconductor nanocrystals. This paper was put out in 2000. So the first question you ask about this presentation is just what are nanocrystals? So nanocrystals are basically very small particles with axes that are on the nano scale. So this is basically particles with most of their axes fall between the 1 to 100 nanometers. Uh, why do we care about these crystals? So nanocrystals exhibit unique optical and electronic properties because of some of their physical aspects. So one very obvious example that is very uh, is seen uh, has been seen for a long time is how uh, the physical properties of these nanoparticles actually affect the band gap energy. So this can be seen in the, uh, the equation below. This equation is actually the effective mass model put out by Bruss in the year 1984. So in this model, in this equation, he's basically relating what the band gap energy is for the bulk material to what it would be for the nano, nano uh, particle. So as you can see in this equation, uh, I have outlined all the variables below. But the important ones to notice are the fact that the radius of the particle directly affects what, how the, uh, the bulk band gap energy is changed into the uh, defective band gap for the nanoparticle. Along with the radius, also the, uh, the effective mass of the electron and the effective mass of the electron hole, so that's the ex uh, exciton energy, are also, also play a factor in how much this uh, band gap energy is being changed. What these uh, two images are showing is that as you decrease the size of your nanoparticle, you are going to uh, increase the band gap that they're, uh, they're going to show. So that actually uh, would change the color basically from the red, which is the smaller band gap, to a blue. And then uh, this image here on the right shows uh, different cadmium selenide samples that they're able to synthesize at Rice University. And as you can see, as the... Um, as the nanoparticles get smaller, like I said, you're moving from a red to a blue-ish color. Finding them, finding them as quantum dots, and to being able to control their shape into the paper that I'm talking about today. So the, uh, this whole process started in 1981 with Alexei Ekimov. Alexei Ekimov actually discovered quantum dots while working with semiconductor doped glass. So he was working with this bulk product in glass, and as he was working with them, he was seeing the different colors that uh, this glass was exhibiting. So basically, these different colors were based on the quantum dots that were present into this glass, and he was able to, to discover these quantum dots and quantify the that these were the reason why this color was changing. So moving from 1981 to 1984, in 1984, Louis Bruss was able to synthesize nanocrystals. He was able to synthesize nanocrystals as small as 4.5 nanometers in radius. And uh, this was very useful because he was able to use these very small nanoparticles to show the quantum confinement effect of the electrons of the, par of the uh, particles. So he, he was able to show these quantum confinement but based on the same color change. So once this color change was happening, you know you have the, uh, the quantum confinement and you know that these, uh, these nanoparticles are responsible for color change based on their size. Uh, moving from 1984 to 1993, you move into uh, where Murray, Norris, and Vandewey were able to demonstrate a synthesis of uh, minor dispersed semiconductor nanocrystals. So they were able to use uh, cadmium and a, a variety of different uh, semiconductor materials to synthesize very similar shape, sorry, very similar sized particles. So through their synthesis, they got uh, uh, mostly quantum dots, and they were uh, all able to have the same size. Uh, this was very critical. It's a very important paper because having this all them all the particles be the same size basically gives you the same properties. So since I was just discussing how their size affects their properties, 
if you want to use any of these uh, quantum dots or quantum shapes, any of them, for uh, applications, uh, they must they be most useful if they all had the same property. So in order to have the same property, you need uh, all the you know, quantum shapes or quantum particles to have the same size and shape usually. So having a good, uh, reliable method that you can systematically make uh, monodispersed particles is critical to uh, applying these uh, these particles towards an application. Uh, moving from 1993 to 1998, we move into three of the authors of the paper that I'm going to discuss in a second. Actually, this is this paper came out two years before they uh, they found the, the shape control synthesis. So. Uh, in this paper, they basically outline their method of uh, making monodisperse cadmium selenide particles. And then eventually, using this synthesis, they were able to demonstrate a way to control their, uh, this, the shape of their, their particles that they were making. So basically, in this one, they, like I said, they were able to uh, make these cadmium selenides very monodisperse. And they were able to uh, regulate the, the growth kinetics of the synthesis of the reaction that was happening in order to um, get these monodispersed particles. Let's look at the paper that I mainly focused on, which is entitled Shape Control of Cadmium Selenide Nanocrystals. This paper came out in the year 2000. And it's mainly focused on, as the title says, it's mainly focused on being able to control the shape of when you're synthesizing cadmium selenide nanocrystals. So they mainly did this by controlling the growth kinetics of this reaction. And then they were mainly uh, trying to synthesize cadmium selenide nano rods. So cadmium selenide particles tend to take either two shapes into nano rods or nano dots. And uh, these shapes are based on the word site structure that you see below. So this word structure uh, is kind of unique. It has this hexagonal shape on top, and then it has rectangles basically coming down the side. So in order to get a nano dot, you basically want all three axes to grow together. You want, uh, yeah, so this hexagon will get bigger and bigger, and basically the uh, you get a very circular shape because all the axes are growing together. And if you want a rod, uh, basically, what you're doing is you want to extend the rectangles so they get longer and longer. I want to call this uh, elongation of this the, these rectangles. I'm going to call this the C-axis. So going down into the uh, paper is going to be the C-axis where these rectangles are getting longer. And you want these rectangles to get longer because this is how you get a nano rod instead of a nano dot. So now let's talk about the method. So this method basically used two method, two milliliters of a stock solution, and uh, this stock solution was made up of powdered selenium, dimethyl cadmium, and tributyl phosphine. Uh, these three were put together in, uh, in a ratio of one to two to thirty-eight by weight. Uh, that was the ratio. And then once these this stock solution was made, it was injected into four grams of topo and HBA at about 300 degrees Celsius for oh, pretty much less than a second. Uh, topo and HBA are actually surfactants, and they're going to uh, mediate the growth of the cadmium and selenide uh, atoms. And uh, this injection happened for less than a second because that's about all you need for the nucleation of these cadmium selenide nanoparticles to start. So this nucleation phase is basically where the cadmium and selenide nanoparticles were created. They were uh, synthesized at this very beginning. And then after less than a second, this temperature was dropped down to about 300 degrees Celsius. Um, this drop in temperature was basically to switch it from being able to, to nucleating new cadmium selenide uh, particles to just growing the ones that are already there. So this drop in temperature made, it, uh, made you switch from the nucleation phase to the growth phase. Uh, during the, uh, the growth phase that they were... They were uh, they started monitoring this reaction, and they, they found that uh, there was a sort of a focused growth phase, and there was an unfocused growth phase. Uh, they called these two different, they called them focused and unfocused because during the focused phase, they were getting the growth that they wanted. They were getting the, uh, 
the quantum rod growth instead of the quantum dot. Uh, so they wanted to figure out what was the difference between these two phases. Since they knew that they were getting the correct growth during the focused phase, and that the incorrect, so that the incorrect growth being that there was growing, all axes were growing uniformly, so you're getting that uh, quantum dot shape forming. So they were trying to figure out what was the difference between these two phases. Uh, they figured out that the biggest difference was in the monomer concentration. So the monomer concentration is of the uh, selenium, uh, cadmium, and uh, the tributylphosphine. So when that concentration was dropping, so at, at, right at the injection, the concentration would be very high. And then as some of the cadmium and selenide would, would grow onto it, this concentration would drop and drop. And it would, when it crossed over at a critical threshold, uh, the concentration would be so low that the, uh, the growth of all the axes would be about equal. So you have that uniform growth, which they didn't want. So in order to form a monodisperse uh, quantum rod that they was they were seeking, what they would do was uh, after this uh, injection and then uh, the drop in the temperature to have this growth phase, once they thought their focused phase was over, they would take the heat off, uh, stop the reaction, and then uh, take a little aliquot of the, uh, the nanoparticles that they had made and actually test it using a UV vis and photoluminescent spectra. So they were able to examine it and see what kind of growth they had gotten so far. So once they were able to kind of determine what, what phase they were in, they would then, uh, if they wanted it to grow longer, if they wanted the rod to go longer, or if they had gotten the dot instead of the rod because they waited too long, they would just inject more of the monomer. So they would inject more of these uh, reactants so that the monomer concentration would go back up so it would be very high. So then you would go back to the focused phase. So you would go back to the growth that you wanted in order to get the quantum rod. Uh, the, the other thing that they did to also ensure that they were getting the rod was add HBA. So as I said earlier, HBA and topo are basically uh, surfactants. Um, when they initially did this test with the 1998, sorry, yeah, 1998 version, uh, they weren't using HBA. Uh, they found that if they used technical grade topo, so that's like 90% purity on the, on the topo, um, they were finding that they were actually getting the growth a little bit uh it was easier to control when they were using pure topo, uh, T-O-P-O. They were, um, all the axes were growing uh, a little bit uncontrollably and a little bit too much at a time. So they were unable to get uh, narrow rods that were small enough to still exhibit the quantum confinements effect that they need to have these different, uh, you know, the different uh, colors or different, any of the different properties that you have when you have these quantum confinement effects at the very small scale. So basically, they were using HBA as a, um, an impurity. They were, it was an impurity of the uh, TOPO that they were using to ensure that the growth was not happening too fast and that the, and the correct growth was happening. This HBA makes the, uh, uh, makes the whole reaction a little bit anzeotropic for the C-axis. So you're getting the, uh, the correct growth on, that, on the uh, C-axis to make sure that you're getting a rod and not the dot that they were previously getting with the pure TOPO. So now let's examine some of the results that they were able to get from the experimental method I just outlined. So uh, they used TEM images to show uh, descriptions of the quantum rods that they were able to synthesize. So TEM is transition in electron microscopy. So basically what you're doing is you're shining a beam of electrons through a very thin sample of what you're able to synthesize. And then the image basically is how the beam of electrons interacts with your synthesized uh, particles. So if we look at some of the TEM images here on the left that they were able to show us, um, you can see that they were able to get pretty monodispersed samples, uh, pretty monodispersed uh, runs for the different quantum samples. Um, if you compare A and B, or even B and C, you can see that they were able to get very different sizes in the quantum rods that they were synthesizing. So in C, you're getting maybe uh, five to six nanometer rods here. And then compared to the ones in B, where they're getting maybe 15 nanometers or 20 nanometers. So they were able to get a pretty big difference in the, uh, the length of the C-axis they were able to uh, synthesize based on their, um, their method. 
Uh, on the right here, there are more TEM images of the quantum rods that they will synthesize, but these rod, this, these images are basically the other way. So they took the, uh, the rods and turned them so you can look down the C-axis, like I was talking about earlier. Uh, the C-axis, like looking down this way, kind of lets you see the hexagonal shape that uh, these quantum rods have. I mean, not all of them like, you know, look perfectly hexagonal like that one, but uh, they give you the, the distinct shape. And then um, you can also compare this the hexagon with the rod uh, length. So you can see the difference between like the, uh, the radius of the hexagon on top compared with the length of the rod length of the c-axis which gives um some more things that they were able to more spectrum that they were able to take to better characterize the uh the nano rods that they were synthesizing uh the first one on the, on the left here is uh, an x-ray diffraction of two of the cadmium selenide rod uh, shaped samples that they were able to synthesize uh as you can see in the uh, top one the uh aspect ratio is very is a lot closer to one compared to the second one, where it's almost two. So this is basically the C to A is talking about the length of the C axis versus the A axis. So you know in this top one, it's a lot closer to a dot, or a lot of the axes are more uniform in size. And then in the second one, you're getting the uh, elongation of that C axis to get it more into a rod. So you can just see in between these two, uh, this two spectrum, that there is a pretty big difference in the uh, x-ray diffraction that's happening so when the electrons are being shot into the uh to these quantum uh sorry to these nanocrystals that the uh the inside electrons that are diffracting the x-rays have very different energy which is giving you these differences in peaks as you're seeing down here and then uh on the right here these are two uh uv vis and photoluminescence spectrum of the uh, cadmium selenide quantum dot up on top here so again this uh, aspect ratio is pretty close to one so that would be a quantum dot <clears throat> compared with this bottom one where you're getting a, a lot closer to almost two for the aspect ratio so you know your c axis is going to be a lot longer than your a or b axis one thing to also note in this uh in these two spectrum is the splitting that's going on so the splitting between the uv and the photoluminescence is not very much here in this top one Compared to this bottom one, where you get, you're seeing a very big difference in the splitting between what it's absorbing and what it will actually emit, what wavelengths of light is going to absorb and emit. So one thing this could be useful for is actually in, uh, in uh, LEDs. LEDs uh, have a problem with recombination of electrons. So the splitting that happens between what they're absorbing and what they're emitting could actually be helpful to uh, put, put some of these nano... Uh, rods in uh, LEDs so that these splitting can help with the recombination that needs to occur for LEDs to work. What are some applications for them? So what, what can you do with them now that you have these uh, these small amount of dispersed uh, quantum rods, these quantum uh, cadmium selenide rods? So one of the things you can do is you can incorporate them into photovoltaic cells. So these are the solar cells that are going to absorb uh, uh, light from the sun to absorb photons. So uh, one thing that one reason you would want to include them would be you would include them alongside of another uh, semiconductor, one that would have a lot larger band gap. So in this example, they used uh, titanium oxide. So you would include these cadmium selenide um, particles because they absorb light in the visible spectrum. So this is the light coming from the sun, or it's, it's part of the light coming from the sun actually. But uh, so they would absorb this visual visible spectrum light absorb the photon, the photon would excite the electrons, and then the electrons can move up into the excited le energy levels that they had there for the quantum uh, selenide, and then this electron can move over into the titanium oxide's higher uh, excited energy uh, levels, where the band gap is a lot uh, larger, so a lot, it would be a lot uh, harder for this uh, electron to get uh, decided back down to the uh, unexcited energy level. So now that it's up there, it's a lot easier to generate a photo current based on uh, the electron being up here in the excited state. So uh, that's great and everything, but what's the difference between using a cadmium selenide uh, dot here versus a cadmium selenide rod? Well, the one thing that's uh, a big difference would be that uh, the quantum dots would not be quite as good at um, trapping the electrons, and then they would also not be quite as good at... Uh, once the electrons are trapped, they're not quite as good as like transferring them uh, to 
either more other cadmium selenide dots or to the titanium oxide. This is something that the rods are actually pretty good at. The rods, um, they have a tendency to form like these directed chains so that the rods kind of line up together. And then the, uh, the electrons are a lot, it's a lot easier for the electrons to move between these different rods. So uh, as you can see at the, on the, in the graph down here, the, uh, the more, type, the more uh, cadmium selenide uh, concentration or more that you're adding to the uh, titanium oxide, the, uh, the more absorbance you're getting of these uh, wavelengths in the physical spectrum. So you can see here on the E, you're getting the most absorbance and uh, the most absorbance will uh, hopefully lead to the highest photo current and the most uh, energy that you're getting from the, uh, the sun into this photovoltaic cell. Uh, one of the less uh, explored applications of cadmium selenide quantum rods would be in the use of in the use for gas sensors. So these would be sensors that would be able to detect whether a target gas was in the environment or not. So one of the target gases that uh, people have used is actually uh, oxygen. So basically what you're trying to do is based on the reaction with the environment, you can see if the target gas is present and how the photoluminescence would change. So some gases, some gases like the target gas you're trying to look for, would dramatically increase or decrease the photoluminescence seen for that nanocrystal. So being able to, to uh, have this drastic change of photoluminescence, that can be monitored, and then you can tell how much of that gas you would have. Um, this application isn't studied quite as much because um, a lot of the cadmium selenide uh, quantum dots and rods typically have a very thick organic ligand layer surrounding them, and that makes this detection uh, difficult because not as much of the gas will actually be able to interact with the cadmium selenide uh, nanoparticle itself. They will just interact with the organic ligand layer. So this sometimes this application takes a little bit different uh, synthesis. Uh, you have to change how you're synthesizing these uh, cadmium selenide rods, but they can be used to uh, detect certain gases in the environment. applications of what being able to control the shape of any nanoparticles could do for you. So how does this being able to control the shape uh, help you? So just one example I wanted to highlight was that in uh, 2014, the, uh, a research article came out describing how the shape of nanoparticles can help with cancer treatment. So one of the ways that you would want to treat cancer would be to actually get some of these very small nanoparticles through the body and then for them to reach the tumor or the tumor cells uh, and the cancer cells. So uh, some ways that uh, shape could actually uh, affect the nanoparticles as they're being used to treat these cancerous tumors is, um, well, the nanoparticles have to be able to be injected and then move through the bloodstream of the person. And uh, as they're moving through, they have to be able to, through a process called margination, move from the uh, flow of blood down and hit the endothelial cells and move into the blood vessels. Now the shape can actually assist in this because if you just have uh, quantum dots like we sh you see here, uh, these quantum dots are just going to continually spin and the spin is not really going to help you move towards the uh, outside of the, the veins or the arteries or wherever they are. Uh, the quantum rods actually do kind of help in this because as they spin, they kind of build up the momentum. Uh, of the spin, and as you can see, like the, the momentum can actually push them down towards these endothelial cells so that they can actually hit them a little bit more often, and as they hit them more often, that could help them get absorbed better, and if they're absorbed into these uh, blood vessels, they can be in, uh, absorbed and get to the tumors uh, a little bit easier than maybe the, uh, the spherical nanoparticles or the, the quantum dots. So this is one reason why that quantum rods could be useful uh, in a medicinal purpose. So cadmium and, and uh, cell, cell, cell light. So um, some of the, the, these particles have, can have uh, a toxicity. They can be very toxic to the body if they are uh, 
the least in a certain way. So if, uh, if any of these cadmium selenide nanoparticles are broken down, or if any of the cadmium uh, is released as cadmium 2 plus, uh, cadmium 2 plus is pretty toxic to the body. So you could also, if you have done incorrectly, uh, using cadmium selenide could actually make you sicker than uh, getting better at all. Uh, there's also the fact that these cadmium selenide nanoparticles tend to be very stable towards aggregation. Uh, this is also uh, can be very harmful to the body. So when using cadmium selenide nanoparticles for uh, use in the body, they have to be very carefully monitored and very synthesized in a very particular way. So they're not having any of these negative effects, but you only having the effects uh, that you want in order to have the uh, cancer treatment be a success. sources that I got my information from. And just for some thank yous, I want to say thank you to the University of Pittsburgh, and I want to say thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something new about uh, cadmium selenide nanoparticles and how you can control their shape based on what how you're synthesizing them. Thank you.